we can give. <laughs> Questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Wages growth is the lowest in decades after eight long years of this government. Why is the Prime Minister making it worse than allowing cuts to wages through the legislation that's before this parliament? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, what the Leader of the Opposition has just said is just not true. Correct. And Mr Speaker, I've noticed this now over a period of time. Members on both Mr. sides. Mr Speaker, what our government's economic recovery plan is about putting Australians back into work and to ensure that businesses can do just that. All of our plans are designed to get Australians back into work. Mr Speaker, that includes modest changes to industrial relations, Mr Speaker, changes that, uh, that those who would, would have liked much greater changes. The government has not gone down that path. And I would say, Mr Speaker, Member that those Bruce. opposite are overreaching here, Mr Speaker. We're just trying to get people back into jobs. The member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the Morrison government's plans to continue our recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic will focus on building our economic strength in the year ahead so we can continue creating jobs opportunities and certainty for Australian businesses and workers. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Ryan for his question. Um, he knows, as I think most Australians now do, that the economic comeback in this country is, is underway. It, it began last year, Mr Speaker. Some 90 per cent of the jobs that were lost over the course of the terrible COVID-19 recession and pandemic have come back into the economy. Australians are joining that recovery by voting with their feet, with, the, with participation in our, in our workforce rising again back to record highs. And uh, that has led the Governor of the Reserve Bank to say in Australia the economic recovery is well underway and has been stronger and earlier than expected, Mr Speaker. These outcomes have been underpinned, the Governor of the Reserve Bank says, by Australia's success on the health front and the very significant fiscal and monetary support. A hallmark of the economic recovery plan has been the absolute synchronisation of fiscal and monetary policy. And I thank the Reserve Bank for the way that the Governor and the Board have worked closely with Treasury here to ensure that our economic recovery plan has been so closely aligned. And with measures like the Home Builder Program, Mr Speaker, that today we read housing building approval figures highest on record, Mr Speaker, at a time of a great pandemic, at a time of a COVID-19 recession, the interventions that have been targeted by this government, targeted, proportionate, ensuring that those jobs would be there, Mr Speaker. As we looked into the abyss of this pandemic back in last March, we knew that we would need to take actions urgently in a range of sectors, Correct. but in particularly in the residential construction industry. And here we see housing building approvals, Mr Speaker, people responding to get and be part of this comeback. But the delivery of the vaccines, Mr Speaker, is critical over the course of this year. The delivery of safe, accessible, effective vaccines. TGA approved, Mr Speaker, by the finest regulatory agency for vaccines anywhere in the world. 140 million doses secured by the great work of the Minister for Health and, his, and the Secretary of Health, Professor Murphy, Mr Speaker, with a sovereign capability to produce those vaccines here, a sovereign capability that so many countries around the world are envious of. Over a thousand points of distribution linking in pharmacists GPs, Mr. Speaker, hospitals, uh, respiratory clinics, and a clear priority for the rollout, Mr. Speaker. And today, as I, as I was able to advise the Pacific leaders who we joined with in the Pacific Islands Forum today, and it continues as we speak, $200 million also to invest in supporting them for the full rollout of vaccines, and to be working with the French government and the United States government to ensure that all of our Pacific families. From the Micronesian states right across the Polynesia, Mr. Speaker, that in this part of the world we are looking after our family when it comes to the vaccines. The member for Dobell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Under the Prime Minister's industrial relations changes, a part-time disability care employee working a Friday to Sunday shift 
could lose more than 14,000 a year from their take-home pay. Workers in the care economy supported Australians through the pandemic. Why is the Prime Minister allowing cuts to their take-home pay? The Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the premise of the question is completely false. Uh, there is no members on my left. No evidence whatsoever of any such contention. And in fact, and in fact. Um, Yesterday, the member for Watson and the member for Cryo referred to a document which they said was uh, evidence of the sorts of things that were put in that question. In the member for Cryo's words yesterday, the government's IR changes were being cited as reasons for workers on $57,000 losing penalty rates. Then the member for Watson said the government's proposed IR reforms would facilitate a decrease in wages for store managers. And the document that they seem to be referring to, and that seems to be the proposed uh, basis for your members on uh, it's both no sides, no wonder you're probably glad I didn't let you table it, because it doesn't show what you say it shows. What that document appears to be is a joint proposal before the Fair Work Commission regarding retail award arrangements, and in a statement yesterday from the Australian Retailers Association, they said this quote. The proposal is the in the uh, minister will resume truth his problems seat. is what you've the got. Members on both sides. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. On a point of order of direct relevance, we have a very specific question mm. about a carer and the impact there. By his own admission, the Attorney General says that he is now referring to a different process and a different question. He has and explained to the House why he is not being relevant. Yeah, I'll just say to the manager of opposition business, uh, I'll say to the manager of opposition business a couple of things uh, just before I rule. Um, certainly the question, had I, whoever's got their phone, if you could switch it off, that'd be handy. Um, it did have a specific question in it, but it also had a preamble and then it also had a statement uh, afterwards about the pandemic. So, I mean, these things aren't hidden, they're live, <laughs> so it does open it up. But I do, I do say to the Leader of the House, he's entitled to briefly uh, refer, he's more than briefly referred. He has the opportunity to add to an answer, uh, which he could do at the end of the question time on uh, yesterday's question. It's not an opportunity to, to relitigate yesterday. The Leader of the House. And the difficulty, of course, Mr Speaker, is that there's no evidence of anything that they propose, because it's not true. And the document, and I'll take the interdiction, the document that the Leader of the Opposition is referring to, that they sought to table yesterday, we now know what that document is. That is a proposal before the Australian Retailers Association. It's a proposal before the Fair Work Commission. We know exactly what it is. That is a proposal before the Fair Work Commission. Uh, with respect to award arrangements. No. And the Australian Retailers Association had this to say yesterday. No, just the, the, proposal... leader, sorry, the, leader, the leader of the House, the... You, you cannot proceed to answer yesterday's question. I said you could briefly refer to it. The question was not about retailers in any way, shape or form. The Leader of the House has the call. The question's premise is completely wrong. There's no evidence for it whatsoever, and it is as wrong as the statement that was made by the Leader of the Opposition before Christmas at peak desperation when he said that workers were being given a Christmas gift of a pay cut. Did that happen? The difficulty is that when you're truly desperate before Christmas and you predict that something will happen at Christmas, but it doesn't happen, you have no authority and you're not being truthful. Members on both sides, the manager of opposition business seeking to table the document. Yeah, to table the document from the Attorney General to the Fair Work Commission, where he requested that they undertake the work that he just referred to. Is leave granted? Leave. <laughs> <laughs> the member for Cowper. <laughs> member for Cooper will cease interjecting. The member for Cowper has the call, not the member for Cooper.
is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister please inform the House how the Morrison McCormack government's continued investment in regional Australia is creating a stronger Australia as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want a fierce advocate, the member for Cowper is for the Mid-North Coast and indeed regional Australia, Mr Speaker. As we all know in this place, he is also un an unwavering advocate for road safety uh, in his role as chair of the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. Now, as a former police officer, he's experienced firsthand the consequences of road trauma. In the October budget, the federal government allocated an additional $2 billion for a new road safety program. And the, this will be rolled out in every state and territory to improve road safety outcomes. It will save lives. It will save lives. And that's the most important thing. And in regional seats, member for Ballarat, it will save lives. An important component in improving road member safety. For Ballarat. You'd think she'd be interested in no, saving the Deputy lives Prime Minister road safety, will Mr. Speaker. But is improving road infrastructure, which is exactly what this government is delivering. In the Member's electorate, we are delivering the transformational Coffs Harbour bypass yeah, yeah. as part of our $110 billion pipeline of infrastructure over the next decade, supporting, encouraging, enhancing and ensuring 100,000 jobs. And that's what it's all about as we build out of COVID-19 jobs, jobs and more jobs. This project will take more than 12,000 vehicles out of the Coffs Harbour Town Centre, bypass 12 sets of traffic lights and save 11 minutes of travel for road users. And this, it's a 14-kilometre bypass and it's made possible by the $1.46 billion allocation investment by this government. I know how hard the member for Cowper has worked towards achieving that. Safety and efficiency benefits are a priority in the delivery of this project. But importantly, vitally, it's supporting 12 thousand jobs, twelve thousand jobs over the lifetime. And that means local procurement. People in Coffs Harbour's town centre are going to benefit in their small businesses from this project. It's but one example of the stability and certainty provided by this government's infrastructure package and programs. Through the local roads and community infrastructure program we've committed fifteen point four million dollars across the electorate of Cowper. Five local government areas share in this allocation, allowing each to deliver the infrastructure works from small to large, but again it's about local procurement and local jobs. Projects such as the Crown Street Rehabilitation in Belgium demonstrates how these programs are supporting, again I say, local jobs, local jobs and small businesses. And the Assistant Treasurer, the Minister for Housing, will be delighted to know that uh, Pike on Homes and Constructions, Port Macquarie, second generation family owned small business, they're doing very well out of the Home Builder program. And uh, they're building homes on the mid north coast, they're supporting jobs, they're supporting the economy, and they're supporting local families to get the that Deputy first Prime Minister's home. time has concluded. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Under the Prime Minister's industrial relations changes, a part-time car parking attendant working only three days a week, including Saturdays and Sundays, could lose more than $13,000 a year from their take-home pay. Why is the Prime Minister punishing workers who are struggling to find and keep secure jobs during a pandemic? The Minister for Industrial Relations. The premise of the question again is wrong. That figure is totally untrue. There is no evidence whatsoever. And if the member has such evidence, then he can explain it to the House. Members on both sides. The member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Louisa is 95 and receives a level four care package. Her provider charges over $1,100 every month in management fees. This is 25 per cent of her care package funds. Some elderly constituents in my electorate are gouged up to 45 per cent of their care package in management fees. In regional areas, there's often one provider and little choice. Minister, this is not reasonable, as the legislation states. It's a rort. Will you protect our elderly Australians and implement a cap on management fees that can be charged by my age care providers? The Minister for Health. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the member for mayor. I think this is actually a very uh, important question. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the reforms that we Ma members on my left, the minister has the call. One of the, uh, one of the reforms which we put in place with regards to my aged care was precisely to ensure that fees are published. Uh, already, the advice I have is that 93 per cent of the uh, at my aged care home care provider fees are already being published. And I have asked the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, uh, Janet Anderson, to ensure that all are published or to take action to ensure that there are show cause notices. So I think that uh, the point you raise is very important. The second element is that individuals under our reforms must be given notice of the level of fees. That was brought into, into being as of the 1st of July 2020. The third element you raise is with regard to future actions. And, uh, one of the items which the Prime Minister and I are looking forward to with regards to the Royal Commission due within a matter of weeks, a commission which was never previously called by those on the other side, but which was called and delivered by the Prime Minister in his first Members on my left. Member for Hotham. At home Member care for uh, and residential care, and to ask for fearless recommendations. My expectation is that there will be recommendations, and if they are, we will act. And if there aren't recommendations in this space, we will also be acting. So, in either way, but we want to see, understandably, what that Royal Commission recommends and take them forward either on the Commission's basis or, if it's not there, on any other basis. The other point that I would make is that we have increased the number of home care packages from 60,000 to over 195,000. 60,000 in 2012-13. The member behind Marsh will remember that figure because that's what it was under him. It's more than triple that now. The number of, uh, uh, the number of relevant uh, population has increased by 28 per cent, but the number of packages has more than tripled in that time, and that's giving more choice and better care to a higher number of people and a higher proportion of that population than has ever been the case before. The member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer remind the House how the Morrison government's focus on creating jobs and supporting livelihoods is helping to ensure a stronger Australia? in 2021 and beyond. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you. thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Chisholm and acknowledge her experience in small business before coming to this place and as a speech pathologist and in joining with those on this side of the House to deliver tax cuts to more than 70,000 people in the electorate of Chisholm, Mr Speaker. That is what the member for Chisholm has helped do in this place. Now, Mr. Speaker, Member for year, Solomon is warned. Last Treasure year will go on. saw the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. It helped create the COVID-19 recession. Since then, the Morrison government has responded with more than $250 billion in direct economic support. That's around 13 per cent of GDP. It is more than double what the states combined have committed, Mr. Speaker. We saw the Reserve Bank ease monetary policy by boosting liquidity, by buying bonds in the secondary market, by cutting the cash rate. And we saw 25 million Australians bond together to help suppress the virus, whether they were mum and dad at home following the health rules or whether they were wonderful health workers on the front line. Now, Mr Speaker, the net result has been that Australia's economic recovery is now underway. 90 per cent of the 1.3 million Australians who either lost their jobs or saw their working hours re reduced to zero are now back at work. Consumer and business confidence has recovered to its pre-pandemic levels, and we saw the biggest jump in quarterly economic growth since 1976. That is why the Reserve Bank Governor, and he has again referred it, re reaffirmed it today, has said that the economic recovery is happening earlier and stronger than first forecast, Mr. Speaker. Now, this leaves Australia better positioned than nearly any other country in the world. 
with the IMF forecasting that the economic impact of COVID-19 will be much more severe in the United States, across Europe, whether it's the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, in Canada, in Japan and nearly every other country around the world. So, Mr Speaker, we acknowledge that the job is not done. There is still a lot of work to do to get Australians back into a job. But the recovery is well underway and the government's record economic support is helping Australians get back to work. The member for Chifley. My questions to the Prime Minister. Almost 90,000 jobs in manufacturing have been lost under this eight-year government. Prime Minister, why has the government failed to protect jobs in manufacturing in Australia? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, who has championed the modern manufacturing strategy that was outlined in the last budget, Mr Speaker, some one and a half billion of investments in the future of advanced manufacturing in this country, Mr Speaker, uh, she will tell you that that is how you're going to create manufacturing jobs going forward in this country. But one of the things that will be absolutely conditional on, Mr Speaker, is the platform that is established by lower taxes, more competitive uh, arrangements for businesses, Mr Speaker, to ensure that their energy prices, Mr Speaker, are lower, that their access to GATS feedstock, Mr Speaker, is at levels which enables them to achieve the sort of uh, things that were able to be achieved in the United States with the way that gas became available in the United States. And that's why our manufacturing policy is based on the platform of those broader based reforms. But on top of that, Mr Speaker, it is investing in the things that puts people into those jobs. And as the Treasurer reminds, the national skills platform that we are establishing with the states and territories, the new skills agreement that is giving people the forward look on the skills that those Australians will need and the businesses who employ them will need, which is backed up by a $1 billion training fund, Mr. Speaker, the Job Trainer Fund, together with the states and territories, backed in also by the many 30,000 odd places additionally going into educational institutions this year. All of that is equipping our workforce to be the workforce that manufacturing needs to be successful in the future. But, Mr Speaker, I saw this when I was up at the Global Manufacturing Group up there in Gladstone recently, sorry, in Maryborough, Mr Speaker, uh, on a wholly owned Australian metal manufacturer. CMG employs approximately 100 people across its Maryborough and Gladstone operations, and they have utilised the instant asset write-off and a $785,150 grant under the Sovereign Industry Capability Program. Then there's Rymatoll at Maryborough, a $60 million facility expected to employ up to an extra 100 people in full operation by 2022. The government has supported that facility through the $28.5 million in grant through the Regional Growth Fund. There's Delta Hydraulics, Mr Speaker. In Devonport on 15 December, I visited there a family-owned business uh, founded in 1975 by John White that specialised in the development, manufacture and export of hydraulic cylinders and has benefited significantly from JobKeeper, Mr Speaker. There's CSL at Broadmeadows. There's Outsource One in Brisbane and a manufacturer of civil and traffic light signage. There's Rymatel up in Brisbane as well, Mr Speaker, whether it's in defence industries and minerals processing and waste management. Mr Speaker, that is the plan we're rolling out in this country, Mr Speaker. All of that is occurring because of the vision and leadership of this government that is going to create a future for advanced manufacturing that, Mr Speaker, will not be supported by the higher taxes on the electricity and energy Prime Minister's that they time have. Has concluded. I call the member for Bowman. Thank you, Speaker. And a question for the Health Minister. Would the Minister update us and update the House on Australia's world-leading vaccination rates uh, and how that can assure us of a strong uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, which will obviously help Australia uh, become a world-leading nation and in our recovery as we lead our way into a strong economy again. The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I, I want to thank the member for Bowman, who, as a, a young doctor in rural Australia, uh, was very proud of his work in helping to provide vaccinations to uh, people from rural Australia. And, uh, he, along with many others on, on both sides, uh, including the member for MacArthur and, uh, and so many others, uh, have served in the, uh, the medical profession and supported Australians. And, uh, again, 
positive news for Australia in the fight against COVID-19. Zero cases Australia-wide today. Zero lives lost Australia-wide today. Zero Australians on ventilators or in ICU today. Um, at the same time, uh, the world has lost uh, another 15,000 people since we sp uh, spoke yesterday. And so the global pandemic continues to rage. And what that means is that as a nation, despite our strongest efforts at home, we will never be truly safe until there is vaccination abroad and vaccination at home. And that's why the news that we have now achieved record vaccination rates for our five-year-olds is incredibly important. We have gone from 94.9 per cent, which was itself a record in the September quarter, to 95.1 per cent for five-year-old vaccination rates across Australia in the December quarter. The first time Australia has ever passed the 95 per cent mark for vaccination on record. In addition to that, as the Lowitcher Institute explained to me today, the extraordinary Pat Anderson, Indigenous Australia has an even higher rate of vaccination. We sometimes talk about closing the gap. This time we need the rest of Australia to close the gap to reach the extraordinary 97 and a quarter percent vaccination rate for five-year-old Indigenous children. And all of this is important because it's not only protecting those children, but it says that Australians are great vaccinators, that they believe in vaccination, that they practice vaccination, that it's important uh, that Australians continue to follow the TGA. And that's why uh, we are focused on the rollout. And that's why one of the things we're doing is making sure we follow fully the advice of the TGA, not skipping any steps. There are those who wanted to skip steps, to bypass tests, to pass the things that the TGA has proposed and to bring Members it forward on my too left. early. And that is not the right place to be. And what we have done is follow the advice of the TGA because what Australians want to do is make sure that their medicines are safe, they are assessed and therefore they are effective. And if they know that, there's confidence. And if they know that, there's a high take-up. And if they know that, we will protect the nation. The minister's time has concluded. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answer in relation to the inappropriate purchase of watches by Christine Holgate. I was appalled. It's disgraceful, and it's not on. He also said, if she didn't stand aside, quote, she can go. If the Prime Minister is willing to condemn the inappropriate purchase of watches, why won't he stand in this place and condemn the dangerous disinformation about COVID spread by the member for Hughes? Yeah. Yeah. I think we have the same problem as yesterday, and that question, no, I mean, it's, well, you can debate it across the chamber, member for Sydney, or I can rule, I mean, it's. <laughs> member for Barton. I'll be very. I'll be as brief as I can. I won't say be very brief. I don't want to mislead the house. <laughs> but, um, as I said yesterday, it is very clear under the practice that questions can only ask the prime minister or ministers about their direct ministerial responsibilities. And whilst the member for Hindmarsh has referred to a previous answer, as I've said before, that would enable a question to go to the Prime Minister's statements in that answer, not simply ask another question and another question which is out of order. I did undertake to the House to have a look at all of the precedents yesterday that are stated in practice. I can assure you I, I did. There's a number of them that are there and I could read through the Hansards from 1964 right through until um, the early 2000s and, and, and through more recent years, and all speakers have upheld the principle I did yesterday. So the question is not in order. The member for Mallee. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Services. Will the minister outline to the House how new technologies are supporting the Morrison McCormack government national soils and biodiversity stewardship strategies, which will assist in securing the future of our agricultural industry, care for our country, and build a strong Australia? The Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, can I thank the member for Mali for a question and acknowledge? The significant contribution that Electra Mali makes towards the $65 billion agricultural industry and the pivotal role Mali will take in helping agriculture reach its ambitious goal of $100 billion by 2030. Here, here. But to achieve that goal, you have to have the right foundations. And that foundation starts with our soils. Our soils contribute around $930 billion indirectly to our economy each year. So their health is pivotal and important to not only agriculture but to our environment and our whole economy. That's why uh, the Prime Minister of the National Press Club outlined that one of the key focuses this year for our government is around caring for country. And that aligns with our Ag 2030 plan and one of the strategic pillars of that around stewardship, empowering our farmers, giving them the tools to manage their soils, manage their country, not only for increased productivity but also for managing the environment. And a lot of that work has already been done and we have to acknowledge the great work that Major General Jeffries uh, undertook as our first national soils advocate. Uh, he has left a lasting legacy because he's of his passion and commitment for soils. And that's now been taken on by the Honourable Penelope Winsley, AO, uh, and she will carry on in those footsteps, as big as they are, in ensuring that we have a tactile response around real, real outcomes that farmers can understand. Extension work, where how we've got people sitting around kitchen tables explaining the science, collecting the data so that we're equipping those farmers with the new science, the new technology, and allowing them to implement it on their farm. Those are, the, those are the real outcomes that we continue to look for. And that's complemented with the collection of science through a $40 million investment through our soil CRC, making sure that the cutting edge science and technology is continued to be invested in by government, but also industry. And that's making sure those tools are real. We've also said through the Minister for Energy, we have now created $14 million to try and understand and measure carbon in soil. The moment's around $30 a hectare to be able to undertake that. If we can get it down to around $3, that's transformational for our farmers to play another significant role, not just in the stewardship of their land, but in the reduction of, of emissions and carbon in our, in, our, in our environment, letting farmers do the heavy lifting as they have always done. And that complements our biodiversity stewardship fund, $34 million, and I'm proud to say that the ANU has just completed the work around being able to assess the improvement in biodiversity of our farmers from the start to go and being able to re reward them through a number of existing, existing programs that the government's been putting out. Rewarding farmers for the stewardship of their land, improving the biodiversity, baiting carbon, but improving the biodiversity of our country. These are significant investments, not just in our economy, in protecting our economy, but it's also about protecting Australia. The member for McNamara. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the member for Hughes in his capacity as chair of the Joint Committee on Law Enforcement. And I refer to the committee's current inquiry into criminal activity in law enforcement during COVID-19. When will the committee's report be tabled? And has the member for Hughes recused himself from this inquiry given his public comments, trivialising the attack on the US Capitol by right-wing domestic terrorists who injured and killed law enforcement personnel? The Leader of the House, on a point of order, members on my left, members on my left, I just say to the member for Bruce, you're now warned to others, others contributing to a wall of noise, you're not allowing things to proceed. The Leader of the House is entitled to the call as is the manager of opposition business. The Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So um, the limitations on asking a question of a committee chair are narrow and well known. Yep. Uh, page 552 of practice, a question to a committee chair asking when a report would be tabled has been permitted. So the first part of that question, I think, would be in order. Mm. Uh, a question asking if a committee had been requested to inquire into a certain matter has not been permitted. 
uh, extrapolating from that limitation, it's quite clear that the second part of that question is not in order. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, to the point of order, Mr Speaker. Um, the the, uh, on the second point, that the obviously I agree with the, the first point that the Leader of the House made about the reference to tabling being in order, uh, where he says reference to what uh, the inquiry can go into uh, and matters to be considered by an inquiry, that's not what the question refers to. Uh, the question refers to, as you'll find on page 550 of practice, the page before the one that the Leader of the House was on, uh, that can be confined to matters of timing and procedure, whether or not the chair of a committee recuses themselves is a clear matter of procedure, and the question simply provides, because it is essential for the context, given the statements that that member has made publicly, there is a clear context for him to recuse himself when he's then dealing with an inquiry into criminal activity and law enforcement. The Leader of the House. Reading on, Mr Speaker, at page 552, the Speaker has ruled it's out of order— I'm going to tell question. you it's a long book. Indeed. <laughs> the Speaker has ruled out of order a question to a chair which asks that the committee examine certain matters. Questions concerning statements by a committee chair are not permitted, which is clearly a part and parcel of the second part of that question, no matter how they wish to try and dress that up otherwise. Mm. Mm. The second part of that question is clearly not in order. I'll just statement. rule on this. Um, very quickly. So the principles around these questions, as both the Leader of the House and the Manager of Opposition Business have outlined, and we've had calls to outline uh, in the past, are uh, that a private member who's the chair of a committee, the opportunities to question uh, are very limited and narrow, and they really do go to timing and procedure. Uh, and what flows from that is really not an ability to talk at great length other than to just provide the information on timing and procedure. So I am going to rule the question in order. Certainly the second part is very arguable. I, I agree with that. The second part is arguable, but it is still a matter of procedure. Um, it's a very straightforward um, question, really, that goes to, um, for the benefit of all members, um, when the report will be tabled or, and, and whether or not the chair has taken action or not. So it's really um, straight, quite straightforward. Just, I'll just say to the member for Hughes, you're just going to have to just wait a second because it's, it's important for how our committees operate. What the question does, certainly the statements within the question, members on my left, member for Gorton, member for Rankin, will leave under 94A. I'm trying to rule on the matter. Okay? No, it's just, it's just a constant clatter of interjections. <laughs> <laughs> there are parts of the question about that I know the opposition's, you know, relating to the the in order parts of the question that that should be ignored, which uh, um, about his his previous statements. That's absolutely right. The leader of the house is right about that. And what it what the question cannot ask the chair of a committee to do is to go to committee proceedings that have not been reported to the House. So I'm making that clear for the benefit of all members, particularly for the member who I'm now calling to answer the question. The member for Hughes. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, to the member for McNamara, I welcome your interest in the uh, Law Enforcement Committee's work. The committee, yes, is in conducting an inquiry, and we've received many very informed submissions. As yet, we've yet to set a date for reporting, but I look forward to sitting down with the uh, Deputy Chair of the Committee, the Member for Cowan, and we will work that out and we will inform you due with. Thank you. The Member for Fairfax. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question goes to the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Will the Minister please outline how the Morrison government is backing our manufacturers to create jobs? 
as part of our plan to build a stronger Australia and to keep it strong. The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Mr. Speaker, over the last few weeks in particular, I've been out visiting many of our manufacturers, well over a dozen in fact, and every time that I'm out on the factory floor with them, they say to me how appreciative they are of the support that the Morrison government has given to them and to their businesses. So, as you heard earlier from the Prime Minister, there are many things that we are doing to make sure that we get the economic conditions right for every single business in Australia, but especially for our manufacturing businesses. Now, it was just the other week that I uh, visited the member for Fairfax, and uh, he and I announced a grant of $1 million for one of his local businesses, Naturo. Now, they have developed world first technology that extends the expiry of fresh milk to about 60 days. Now they will use the money that we have given to them along with match funding of their own to build a pilot plant in Coolum. That is a process that will take them on the way to scale. And when they scale, they will then start creating jobs in Coolum and jobs in Tasmania. Now, this is just one example of the way that we have used grants such as the Accelerating Commercialisation Grants to assist businesses to take the next steps, to be able to commercialise their products and get it to the market. Now, Mr Speaker, there was a question um, earlier uh, that dealt specifically with manufacturing, and the Prime Minister, as I said, spoke um, in a lot of detail about getting the economic conditions right. I would like to add to, um, to that platform by saying that what we have been uh, doing with our manufacturing strategy is making sure that we are working with industry to look at the subsectors where we will be able to support our manufacturers to become competitive, to be resilient and to build scale, because it is as we build scale that we are going to build the jobs of the future. Now, this is not a short-term process. This is not a quick sugar hit. This is a well-thought-through policy and strategy that will be rolled out over the next 10 years to make sure that we are building manufacturing businesses here in Australia and that we are developing the scale that we need because we understand we understand on this side of the house how important manufacturing businesses are and how important manufacturing workers are because we care about manufacturing in this country the time has concluded the member for Isaacs uh, thank you mr speaker my question is to the Prime Minister. How can the Prime Minister maintain the member for Hughes is doing a good job when, as chair of this parliament's committee on law enforcement, he backed domestic terrorists who attacked the US Capitol, killed and injured police officers and menaced members of Congress? How can a law enforcement committee the chair who defended Isaacs, that conduct— The member for Isaacs can resume his seat. I have, if members interject when I'm about to speak to the House, they will follow the member for Rankin. I've made clear now on a number of occasions, uh, yesterday and today and many times previously, about the scope of questions that are outlined very clearly in the practice and I'm not going to go over it again. When we've been down this path, I think a year or so ago, I also made clear I wasn't going to allow, having made those rulings and made clear the position at great length, as I did yesterday, and I've reaffirmed today, to allow members to willfully ignore the ruling and ask a question that is out of order, simply to reflect on a member of the House. This offends a number of standing orders, not just the standing orders relating to ministerial responsibilities, but also 
reflections on members. That is not to say these matters can't be canvassed in this House at all. The rules for question time are different to other times of the day. The member for Isaacs can contribute in a matter of public importance, in 90 second statements, in an adjournment debate, and if he feels so strongly, he can move a substantive motion, but he is not going to misuse question time. I'm moving to the next question. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Will the minister update the House on the resilience of the resource sector and the highlight to how the Morrison government is assisting this important sector to position Australia for a strong start in 2021 and driving jobs in regional Australia? Thank you. The minister has the call. Well, thank the honourable member for his question. We're back to business, Mr Speaker. The member for Flynn, better known as the Bulldog, not only locally but here, the fighter for Flynn. And it's so important in his electorate, Mr Speaker, the resilience of the resources sector. Sixteen coal mines dotted across his electorate. The port of Gladstone, one of Australia's biggest export ports, coal, LNG, aluminium, a grain, cement. There's a lot of things going out through Gladstone. 1,900 vessels a year, all adding to jobs, all adding to the local economy. Uh, and Mr Speaker, we were in uh, Gladstone last week with the Prime Minister uh, down at Auckland House. The power and the strength of the member for Flynn, he arranged two coal ships to be loaded in the background and mid-speech an LNG tanker arrived, which I think was a great reflection on the strength of the resources sector, the strength of that area of central Queensland and that area around Gladstone. Mr Speaker, the resources sector has been a cornerstone of our economy. Uh, in this area, in the member for Flynn's area, the coal sector employs 3,500 people. 3,500 employed in the member's electorate. They continue to drive our economic recovery. And we need to talk about facts, Mr Speaker. We can forget the misinformation, some of the things which get put out publicly. If we talk about facts, the value of Australian coal exports in December increased by 26 per cent from November. 26 per cent. Worth $3.7 billion to the Australian economy, and that is despite all of the global challenges of the pandemic and otherwise. In fact, Mr Speaker, resources in total to the 12 months of December was up $272.5 billion. $272 billion. Now, that is a testament to the hard work of the men and women of the sector. That is a reflection on getting through the pandemic, driving our economy. What a great result. Uh, Mr Speaker, the ABS noted just last week uh, employed in employment in mining jumped by 22,000 people, 22,000, nearly 10 per cent in the three months of November last year, providing jobs for 264,000 Australians, 264,000. Coal mining was the standout, Mr Speaker, up 25 per cent with an extra 11,000 people, and it's of course increased 23 per cent over the year. That is the most number of Australians employed in the coal sector since 2012. Now, that does not sound like a sector in decline. That sounds to me like the resources sector is increasing, not decreasing. Jobs are going up, not going down. The sector is driving forward out of the pandemic, not going backwards. And I know the Treasurer is very happy about the fact the resources sector continues to kick goals, Mr Speaker, because that is the money that we rely on to pay for the services that Australians require and desire. And that is what we will continue to do. We will continue to support the resources sector in the member for Flins and Electorate and right across Australia because they are delivering for us and they are delivering for our country. Uh, the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On, on that note, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The Mr Prime Speaker, Minister. not on 